I, you know, I, I was doing pretty well career-wise and, you know, I had a, a management position in the newsroom and um, I was the news anchor and I experienced my first real bout of anxiety and depression. Hey everyone, this episode of The Trailblazers is for everyone, but especially for our friends in Trinidad and Tobago, as we feature a popular Trinidad and Tobago presenter, speaker, and writer, Golda Lee Bruce. Stay tuned to hear her inspirational story about her work in media and communications, transitioning to a multinational, and some great work that she is doing. It promises to be quite interesting. I am Tamara McHale, host of The Trailblazers series. Remember to hit the notification bell right below subscribe like comment and share I took a 75 beautiful black x5 to drive in at Tita a second and Oprah grabbed my hand she was like all right you know Show One me. thing that I learned from Steve Harvey's office bar, I remember he had gotten fired from that particular radio station if you don't get single-minded and push certain things, they never get accomplished. Yes, you have to be resolute in your purpose. That is That's right. And you have to put a timeline on it. That must be done by. Trinidad and Tobago media sweetheart Golda Lee Bruce wants to leave the world better than she found it. She believes in the power of stories to motivate people and transform lives. As a journalist and news anchor for over a decade, Golda told the stories of the people of the Caribbean. She continues this work as a development storyteller. As a presenter, speaker and writer, Golda uses her platform to inspire young people in particular. She encourages them to aspire beyond their circumstances, something she was encouraged to do as a student. Golda earned her undergraduate degree in media and communication from the University of the West Indies Mona and her graduate degree in journalism from Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism in New York. She was the recipient of an Arthur N. Taylor Scholarship from Columbia University and an ambassadorial scholarship from the Rotary Foundation. Golda is an alumna of the Thompson Routers Foundation in London, a CNN International Fellow and a Penn Kemba Forum Fellow of the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington, D.C. She believes that with faith and perseverance, any dream is possible. This is what she hopes to impart to every person who crosses her path. It is also a lesson that she hopes to teach her son and daughter. Golda lives with her family in Maryland, USA. Hi, Golda. It is a pleasure to have you on the Trailblazers. Very good to be here tomorrow. Thank you, you so are much for first, the... You're welcome. You're our first Trinidadian or Trinidadian <laughs> guest. <laughs> first of many, hopefully. First of many. First of many. Well, you're a woman of many firsts. <laughs> so, I mean, um, we know of you, well, I know of you as, you know, a television personality because being in media, I would have seen you in your previous dispensation working in media in Trinidad. And you have quite a journey. I mean, I remember one of my former co-workers had a huge crush on you. <laughs> <He was>. Really? <laughs> <laughs> because when I was at uh, Seeing Caribbean TV at Sportsmax, uh, we carried CMC3 um, sometimes. Mm. And so he was like, I just love Gola. She's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks so much for that, I guess. <laughs> You're welcome. So tell us about your, your journey, you know, life growing up for you. What was that like? Whoa, that's a big one. Um, so basically grew up in Trinidad um, with my mother and sister. My father passed away when I was very young. Um, we also live with my grandmother, who has been a huge influence on me. Um, I come from a family of uh, people who value education highly. And I... Um, you know, they're also a family of communicators. So my mother used to be, when she was a teenager, on radio in Trinidad and Tobago. My sister has been a journalist. My cousins have been journalists. So we are a family of communicators. A lot of, um, a lot of us studied humanities. So we have literature majors, history majors, that kind of thing. And my mother is also a, a historian slash sociologist. So um, yeah, a lot of books, a lot of reading, and a lot of Oh, that's my husband. Say yes. 
and a lot of um a lot of you know appreciation for learning yes indeed and i had no idea that you came from such a family so perhaps it was a natural progression that you ventured into the field of media and communications Yes, yes. I think it was definitely a natural progression. Now, many of the people that I just mentioned, uh, you know, they also functioned as teachers as well. And I realized when I started teaching at a community college in Trinidad that, you know, you really do inherit a lot of your, you know, professional abilities from your family. So you went to Caramac. I actually I went did. to Caramac myself. So, yes. So, I mean, tell us how your journey into television began because I understood it was shortly after Caramac. Okay. So, that's a really interesting story. I actually went, well, in your case, came to the University of the West Indies, Mona, to study international relations, right? And when I arrived, I did not, I couldn't get a place at the School of International Relations because I, um, I arrived pretty late, right? I was in, I came to Jamaica. I arrived in Jamaica two days after the semester had already begun. And it was very disappointing for me. And I met a young man at that point in time um, whose name was Orville. And he told me, he said, you know, you just have to go from faculty to faculty and knock on the door and see who answers the door. And so I went to the Caribbean Institute of Media and Communication, and there was an opening. It was actually in radio broadcasting. And a couple months into radio broadcasting, I switched over to television, you know, just thinking that it would be a change and, and I would be a good fit for it. And it turned out to be something that I really enjoyed and that I was um, yeah, pretty good at. And so that was, my, that was the big detour that changed um, my career trajectory. And I, had, I have been in television ever since. So I um, returned to Trinidad shortly after graduating and went straight into an internship and straight into a job after that. So I went into media fairly young, I would say. I mean, some people go in in their teens, but I was there from uh, the time I was 20 years old. And so I had the opportunity to, to grow up on air, I would say, you know. That's kind of a similar story like mine because I started in media at 19 and my mm -hmm. first television role was at 20. So I do understand that. But you are like the darling of media in Trinidad and Tobago. Like you are, people know about <laughs> Gola, you know, Gola Libra. Well, I mean, I was hanging around there for a while, you know. I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was in, um, I was on reading the news for quite a while. So, you know, that, that happened. People began to know who I was and that kind of thing. And I would also, you know, do a lot of speaking engagements and school talks. So even if they didn't know me or they didn't watch me, they, they came to know the name after a while, yes. Definitely. So how is it for those looking on, interested in this career field, how did you manage to solidify yourself as an individual in this industry, in this field? Right. Um, that's a really good question. And I, I think that... In my case, uh, I went in very entry level. I went in as an intern, as I told you. And I think there is great value in being teachable, being humble and teachable in any craft, right? And I believe that that was a kind of secret recipe for me, being teachable, wanting to learn more, wanting to always, you know, try new things and being open to the criticism of people who knew more than me. And, you know, I wasn't always, I wasn't the, the, the you know, the star. I wasn't the star of the newsroom when I entered or, you know, I wasn't someone that people thought may be an anchor or anything like that. But I, I think that that teachability was really, really important for me. And it, you know, it allowed me to really benefit from mentors in the newsroom and people who could guide me along. And that guidance and that leadership was really important and helped me to just remain in, in media for, for quite some time, I would say. Wow. And I mean, as, you know, a trailblazer, you're on the program, the trailblazers, you know, what has been though? Because we like to look at the positive, but we also want to know what, you know, the trials were. What right. for you was the, the most challenging experience or one of the most challenging experience during your career in media? Well, Tamara, as you would know, um, you know, 
that time, like the twenties, the early twenties, especially just coming into the professional world is a time when a many, when many young women find themselves and discover who they are and finding yourself in front of a national audience is difficult. You know, like, who am I? What am I supposed to look like? Is my hair straight? Is my hair curly? You know, do I, how am I supposed to sound? Am I smiling too much? Am I moving my hands too much? And I went through quite a period of, you know, self-discovery that involved many mistakes. I would, you know, I look back at them now as mistakes, but really and truly they were all learning experiences. And so um, I would say that the, the, the trial for me was, you know, coming into my own and dealing with criticism and dealing with being out there, not always knowing what was the right thing to do, you know, and, and just trying to figure it out along the way. And so now I think of it as a, a period in which I really grew and really developed. But when I was going through it, I, I thought, oh my God, this is hard. <laughs> Am I doing the right thing? Am I saying the right thing? Am I acting the right way? And, and so I would say that that was, that was a, a challenge at the time. Okay, so you have now broadened your horizon and you're in the U.S. at a big multinational, you know, corporation yes, and yes. doing some great things. So was that transition difficult for you in any way? It was difficult for me in the sense that, you know, media is all that I've ever known up to the point that I came. Um, it was all that I ever known, all that I have ever known. And so... Um, leaving it behind was difficult. It actually took an emotional toll on me. I thought, you know, just moving from one job to the next or uh, changing my, the country in which I worked would have been, you know, hard, but it was, it was really difficult to kind of uh, close that chapter and move on to the next thing. And the, the way that I comforted myself was that it's not necessarily a chapter closed, you know, it's not like you can never return to media. It's just that you are venturing out trying new things, developing new skills that hopefully, you know, can make me a better uh, media practitioner in the future, if that is what happens, you know? So it, it took an emotional toll, I'll be honest with you. It, it really was like, oh, this is brand new. I don't know what I'm doing. And it was also a steep learning curve for me. So I had to get in there and, and really kind of get my hands dirty quickly. And I, I, I learned a lot. And the lessons that I've learned over the past two years, seriously invaluable. It's invaluable to work for an organization um, this big and this international. It, it, really, it really helps you to broaden your horizons, especially as someone from, you know, the Caribbean, a small island, and you're like, you know, out in the sea now. You're, you're now in a big pot. Yes. <laughs> so, in a so big figure pot. it out, young lady. <laughs> And I do remember when you were leaving and I was like, when I, you know, I think it was, everyone was on the news, the newscast that evening and they were telling you goodbye and everything. I, I remember that. So, I mean, definitely, I understand how that transition could have been difficult for you or was difficult for you. But as you rightly mentioned, you can always go back and you can do both if possible. You never yeah. know. You never know. As a matter of fact, the media skills have, are serving me extremely well. Like I thought, you know, when I first came that I had to sort of distance myself from what I knew before. And it turns out that what I knew before or what I was doing before is now, you know, helping me quite a bit, you know, in, in presentations and in, in meetings and writing and editing and working under tight deadlines. That that experience is serving me exceptionally well. So I'm, I'm really happy <laughs> to have spent those long hours in, in the newsroom mm -hmm. um, for those years. And in terms of what you do as a development storyteller? Yes. What does that entail? <laughs> well, it's, it's basically at the core of journalism is storytelling, as you know. Mm -hmm. And so it's now telling stories, but for a different audience and also with a different aim in mind. So as a journalist, you tell stories for public information. You know, we, we consider ourselves to be the um, standard bearers for democracy, right? And here now in my new position, I tell stories of development in the region. So stories related to the work of the institution that I, 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 I work for and how it is changing lives in the region. So it's the same skill set that, that's being put to use um, but just in a, a bit of a different way, but a way that is important. 
important indeed and one of the things with you Golda you are big on inspiring other young lives yes, yes. you are big on that I actually uh, remember watching I think it was a few months ago a graduation speech that you did yes, that went viral yes. yeah <laughs> and we definitely I'm gonna show a clip of that speech but one of the most humiliating and shameful experiences of my life now that I think back on it I laughed heartily when I learned that my grandmother's caretaker had drawn the items on a grocery list because she could neither read nor write. I was 11 years old, and with my six or so years of primary school education, I thought I had earned the right to humiliate someone who probably never had the opportunity to enter the doors of a primary school. I was convicted. And it's something that we who have the opportunity to learn oftentimes take for granted. The fact that God allows us to have knowledge and the fact that God allows us to learn so that we can be of service to his people and not to hold them to ransom. How do we foster in ourselves a culture of honorable learning? That speech went viral and it was just so impactful. So tell us about your, your work as a speaker. Right. So that came um, kind of by chance. Well, nothing happens by chance, right? It was, you know, I went through a pretty rough time in my life and uh, trying to emerge from that, I realized that I had some influence, you know, the, the position in media had given me some influence to speak to audiences. And I, I, for the first time in my life, realized that I had to use that influence to do something good, to motivate and inspire and to speak to people who experience the darkness that I did in their own lives. And so I started to, you know, accept opportunities to speak. And I would use those opportunities instead of uh, to speak just about media and my role in media and my job as a journalist, but also to speak about the things that I had witnessed in my life that were inspiring and to see how we could use those stories to you know, be better and to live better. And that speech that I gave at, um, it was the University of the Southern Caribbean. You know, I was just there doing what I did at many other institutions um, before. And for some reason or the other, um, the world got its hands on it and it, it really went up quite a long way. Mm -hmm. I had people in Africa and Indonesia and in Australia reaching out to me to say that they had just seen this thing and they wondered who it was. And I thought, wow, when you really just kind of allow yourself to move in a certain direction, um, as one of my favorite authors wrote, the world conspires to help you, you know, do that. And so that, that was the, the speech that you saw. I didn't even realize that you saw that. But I mean, um, looking at that speech, because you mentioned the dark time that you had in your life. I don't know if you want to go into too much specifics, but can you share? I, you know, I, I was doing pretty well career-wise. And, you know, I had a, a management position in the newsroom and um, I was the news anchor and I experienced my first real bout of anxiety and depression and it was scary because I didn't know what it was and I didn't know what had caused it I thought I was just living you know my life and experiencing the normal stresses of anyone who worked in a newsroom of any young mother who was trying to balance uh, family and work um, professional aspirations and so when it happened I was like what is this? Why can't I eat? Why can't I sleep? And it happened to me while I was abroad um, trying to do a media policy course that I really, really wanted to do. So to experience that, I was just like, why can't I do this thing? And it really changed my life because I realized that many of the things that I was doing, I was doing to say that I had done them. And I really wasn't doing it with any true golden motive behind it you know any true um it wasn't driven by love in any way you know and so i kind of when when for anyone who's experienced anxiety or depression you realize that you know if it's one thing that happens your life your perspective and your priorities come into view everything that's not important fades into the background and everything that is important comes right up to your face and you have to focus on it and I realized the things that were important. My family was important. 
and my mission on this planet was more than just the seven o'clock nightly news. And I realized that for the first time in my life. And I was like, okay, I have to accept this. I have to accept that, you know, I have an audience, I have some influence and I need to use it in a different way. I need to use it not just to, you know, not just for the vain reasons, not just to say that I have it, but also to, to make change and to inspire others to live their best lives, you know? Yes. And um, so that's when I decided to do more of that speaking and more of that engagement. And it, it was a difficult process. When I went through, I, I thought, what is happening in my life? Am I just going crazy? Am I, am I fading away? And it turned out that the thing that felt like I was fading away was actually the brightest spark, you know, because it, it lit a flame. And, and now I feel like I am up more in tune with where I'm supposed to be. So I, I'm grateful for it. I wouldn't say that I'm happy about it, but I'm grateful for it. Yes, yes. And grateful for the lesson that you have learned through that experience. Yes. The empathy. The, the biggest lesson is the empathy because, you know, as a young woman in the media, you you strive for a certain perfection. You strive to be perceived as perfect in everything that you do, you know. You want to get that certificate and you want to get that degree and you want to host the show and you want people to say that you've done well. And when something like that happens, you have to sort of drop all of the tools that you've been using to live your life. You know, you drop all of the, the tools of perfection and you, you pick up yourself and yes. you're kind of like, oh my God, who am I? What am I doing? And so um, it, was, it, it, it was a period that I genuinely give a lot of thanks for because it, it changed my mind about a lot of things and helped me to live more wholeheartedly. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I mean, it is indeed a, a significant thing that you mentioned because especially during this time of COVID-19 globally, a lot of persons are actually experiencing depression and anxiety. I mean, yeah. a friend of mine who has fairly successful in his business, doing well and suffering from anxiety and depression as well. So a lot of persons yeah. trying to get themselves out of that funk in yes. a sense. So, so, so yes, I'm continue. By any, I'm not by any stretch of, uh, you know, an expert on this. I, I only know my personal experience, mm -hmm. but it has been that as soon as I opened my mouth and I said, you know, I've experienced this, so many people, have reached out to say me too and I still do and now we talk about it and it's almost as though something that was in a corner you know in the dark you shine a light on it and all of a sudden it has to scurry away it has to you know run away from the light and so shining a light on it is has been really important for me you know having people who would just say I've lived through that you can live through it too um, but also to say that there are so many triggers in our lives that make us anxious and we don't talk about them. You know, we just try to survive them and survive them. And I believe that's what was going on with me. I was just, I was surviving, 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 surviving until my body was like, mm -mm, stop, think yes. about what you're doing. How are you living? Take stock, you know? Yes. And so that's what happened. But I'm not surprised that your friend, even though things may be, may seem to be going perfectly is going through that mm -hmm. and we we we're not often naked you know we're not often by ourselves we always have our phone it's easy to get carried away by the distractions and not ever take a moment to say what am i doing with my breath with my life with this force that i have on the planet and so that's my story, Tamara. That's my story. <laughs> what can I tell you? I, I, I love how you talk though you're so soothing so soothing um but yes you mentioned in terms of purpose though and um that's a lot of you know a lot of persons are searching for their purpose in life what do you think you know is yours and also how do you think persons can be on that path because you found your love in communication and media yes. and storytelling yeah. and using your voice and writing <laughs> so yeah so i um you know, the purpose question is one that I'm asked a lot and I don't always have the most eloquent answer for that, but I do know what my story has been. And my story has been that I believe God has prepared me for my entire life to have the words and the 
inspiration to help people, you know? It may not be millions of people or even thousands or even hundreds, but I do believe that he allowed me to grow with a family of storytellers and then hone those skills in journalism and then experience in my own way depression and anxiety in order for me to be able to take all of those things, bundle them up and be like, hey, go, here's a story. Here's a story about what happened to me. Here's some motivation and some inspiration. Here is a light in the darkness. And so I believe that my purpose is to use my voice in whatever way I can to motivate and inspire. I hope you're not hearing my daughter. She's out there. She's right outside the door laughing and knocking on the door. But yes, that to me is my purpose. And I think that anyone looking to find their purpose, ask, ask, seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened onto you. Ask and listen genuinely for the answer. Yes. Some profound words of advice there, Golda. I, mean, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and see. Yeah, that is so crucial. All right. So we mentioned, you know, the fact that you've migrated from Trinidad in the U.S. now in this multilateral um, agency. But for those looking on from small islands, you know, and they want to experience even more out of life, you know, they have been, become accustomed to life, whether in Jamaica or Trinidad or whichever island they're on, what would be your, you know, your, your words of advice? Because they maybe feel fearful in terms of applying for that job abroad because they feel like, you know, their chances are slim to none. Yeah. What would you yeah. say? So, you know, I'm going to tell you a story. When I was about seven years old, I remember driving, my mother driving me in her car. At that point in time, she was a, she was a PhD student and we had a, a old car. It probably was about three or four different colors. And she was driving me. We were going into Digo Martin, which is in Trinidad, obviously. And we were driving along the coast. And I remember saying to her, how come I was born on this island? Why, why wasn't I born in like a bigger place, like a, a city? I was probably looking out at the ocean and thinking, why, why here? You know, why here where... You know, this is not, I don't see this on TV. This is not where Sesame Street is. So why was I born here? I remember her saying to me that, um, that the people in the big cities are probably asking their mothers the same question. And she went on to tell me that, you know, you are born where you're supposed to be born, right? And you are planted in the soil in which you are supposed to bloom, Right. And from that moment on, I remember, you know, her sort of nurturing in me this idea that even though I was born on, the, on this island, that I was a citizen of the world, that the world was still open to me, that not because I was bound by water, I couldn't cross the water, you know? And so I've always had that in my mind. And there was an article that um, was published in one of the newspapers. It was a feature on me. And I remember it was probably published about 10 years ago and it, it was global citizen. And that was before I left anywhere, you know? And I think that as Caribbean people, it's easy to make your mind or have your mind as small as the geographic location that you're in. And my admonition or my advice is to just break down that wall. The world has broken down every single world. I mean, there you are in Jamaica, here I am in Maryland, and we're having a conversation with each other in real time. I remember my friend telling me as well, and I know I'm giving you a lot right now. Um, no, I, I love it. <laughs> that he went to, I believe it was Vietnam or Thailand, and they went to visit the elephants. And they talked about when from the time that the elephants are very small, they tie them to oh, yes. a chair. Or a post. I know that story, yes. Yes. And when the elephant gets big, all the elephant has to do is just move its foot and it moves the post. But because it's been tied there so long, it believes that it's inhibited. Yes. And we are not inhibited by anything. You know, there's no boundary. Our minds can think of anything. We can dream of anything. We can go to any place. But it begins in here. And if you believe that you are limited to your village or your area, your community or your school, then you'll be limited. But if you don't, I don't think you will be, or you can be. Yes. I love that so much, Golda. I mean, time is winding down already, but I think 
the message from all that you just mentioned is to dream big. Yes. Dream big and remove yes. the limitations. Yes. And, and you know, when, when you start to dream big, there'll be criticism. Quiet it. Silence it. Done with that. Nobody ever built a monument for a, a, a critic. You know, when you dream big, you'll be inundated with fear, your own fear. You'll begin to think, oh, but how can I do this? It's not possible. Why has God put this dream on me? You know, but if you take your first steps, and I, I said it to a group just this morning, if you take your first steps, it's like when an airplane is taking off, right? It requires so much force just to get off of the runway and it has to speed and it has to go. And then when you get into the sky, it shakes. But once you get to your cruising altitude, you're good. You're good. So do the force, do the run, get on the runway and do that part of it and get into the air. And by the time you are at your cruising altitude, you won't even remember what that was like. You'll be like, ah, oh, that happened. So take the hard steps. Take know? the hard steps, dream big, remove the limitations and do great things. Thank yes. you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. I can't believe the time is up already. <laughs> But I, mean, I really enjoyed it as well. I, I can see why you've been, you know, the darling of Trinidad Media for <laughs> so many years because not only are you easy on the eyes, but your voice is just soothing and you are not only that you're passionate and you are a real trailblazer. So continue you to so be much. amazing. Thank continue, you so much tomorrow. Continue to be successful in your endeavors and we look forward to even greater things from you. Thank you so much. But let me just say this one thing to you. I think that what you're doing is amazing. I think, you know, you probably had all of your fears and doubts and insecurities about doing it. And yet you did it. And I think that the person who tries and has the courage to do new things is a hero in my book. So thank you so much for doing this and may it be blessed. Thank you. I received that. <laughs> I claim that.